All right, uh, one or two housekeeping things. One is if your magnet is starting to fall apart on the back of your car for any reason, um, we've got some up here for you. Please grab one, and you can have those for your car. And then the second thing is we sent out our staff survey, faculty staff survey, parent survey. We've had 26 responses, which is great, but we uh, have 160 staff members. So percentage-wise, it's a little low. So if you haven't gotten that or haven't checked that email or haven't seen that, it shouldn't take you but a couple minutes. Fill that out because we do spend a lot of time looking over that information. It's very helpful to us and allows us to compile some ideas. It would have gone out. Teresa's got a meeting right now, but it, Monday, Tuesday? It was it said state of school, third annual state of school. You had, you had to read a little bit to know there was a survey in there. So if you already deleted it, let us know. We'll send it back out. Okay, next time it'll have blinking lights, survey, complete. Okay. Well, please fill that out. Last year, if you remember, in our staff meeting around February or March, maybe February, we go through all that data with you because we want to hear from our parents, we want to hear what they're thinking, what they're feeling about uh, the experience that they're having. It's very helpful for us. It really drives a lot of the things that we look at to see what are some areas of improvement for next year. So more than anyone or more than any other survey, I really appreciate the staff surveys because I know y'all are here, you're seeing everything, you're experiencing it. You, you have a great take on how, what are some areas that we can improve. So it's a good voice for you to be able to do that. And it's anonymous, so you can say anything that you want, and we'll never be able to figure out who you are unless we ask OnSite to trace it, and they'll tell us exactly who it was. I'm kidding about that, but they do. All right, if you have your Bibles, we're in Proverbs 31 today. We started three meetings ago looking at shaping influences and talking about how those shaping influences affect all of our children and all of our students or what I know we're, there's a wide range of audience here those who have children who are grown those who have young children um, those who don't have children um, I, I, I'm, but I'm speaking in general terms here in particular applying to our students but we talked about the things that influence them who they are the last time we were together we looked at about five or six characteristics of what future men should look like from Doug Wilson's book on future women or men and so this time we're transitioning to women and what our young ladies what are some attributes and characteristics we should see in them and what are some things that we should speak to when it comes to their heart and I will tell you this and I was t I was joking around with some people here in, in, in here earlier I've really prayerfully cautiously approached this topic obviously I have girls young I have three daughters but I, I, it's not something that I feel terribly comfortable speaking about. It's not something that I, I, I know sometimes, too, even talking about these types of issues can be heated at times when we talk about roles and all of that and what are the ways that we should train our young ladies, what are some things that we should speak to their hearts. So obviously, from my standpoint, we just always have to go back to God's Word. What does it say? If it says something, then let's speak to that. Let's, let's encourage that in the hearts of our young ladies. And that's what I'm going to try to do is, as I go through about four or five characteristics that we should try to see of an excellent woman here, an excellent, excellent wife. Um, just real quick, I want to lay the foundation for, for where I'm going. And I'm going to come back to this article that's on your um, table here in a few minutes. There is a term in Christendom that's called complementarian, and it might be, not be a term you're familiar with, but I think you're familiar with the concept, and it really is a foundational term that helps us to understand roles when it comes to men and women, girls and boys, helping us to understand what it means that those roles are to complement one another, which is where the term comes from. And I want to break that down for just a second, because I, I think this is really true in Baptist denominational circles, and I'm not just speaking Baptist denominational circles, but I think in... in Christian circles, and I believe this is a biblical, very biblical concept as well, and it helps us to understand how we should interact, interact as different genders. But the idea of complementarianism is defined that way. It affirms that men and women are, one, number one, equal in the image of God. That's very important that we instill that into the hearts and minds of our young people. Men and women, boys and girls, we are all created 
in the image of God. There's no distinction between the two. One is not more so created in the image than the other. Not, one is not superior to the other. There's never to be that thinking unless there's conflict that's going to happen as a result of that. But as you follow along in that definition, even though they're equal in the image of God, they maintain complementary differences in role and in function. That's what it means to complement one another. When we have different roles, different functions, then we complement one another. We come together, men and women do, girls and boys, and, and they work together almost like a jigsaw puzzle that comes together, and it's, it's a beautiful harmony that exists between the two when it's done within the confines of the biblical relationship. What happens, culturally speaking, is, and we understand this, is that we promote either on the male side some egalitarian, press, oppressive type mindset in young men to where they feel like they have to brutally conquer and vanquish and be in charge and push and not accept the biblical role and the mandate that God's given them that we looked at last time to cause things to flourish, take dominion and flourish. But then in young ladies, we preach into them the idea that no one should ever keep you down. The man is going to try to suppress you. You, you should rise above that. You should never allow yourself to in any way submit to that authority. You are basically to come in conflict with that. And so where we've really messed up, and I know I'm, I'm speaking to people who understand this concept, where we've really messed up is we've caused, because of sin, this not complementary role, but this conflicting role between the two. Men and women conflicting, not only within marriages, but in the workplace, wherever the case may be. The workplace is much different, but in particular in the home and in the church, we see this conflict that's taking place. But when it's done in a biblical way, from a complementarian standpoint, what we see in the home is men lovingly, is the key, are to lead their wives and families as women, and the word there intelligently, meaning it's an act of the mind, it's an act of the will, it's an act of the heart, submitting to that loving authority as they lead the home. And that's a standard that we teach. That's a, uh, that is how we specifically see in Scripture that the home is structured. The man leads in a loving way. The woman submits, submits her, herself to that loving, godly leadership in the home, both bearing a, a ton of responsibility. In the church, while men and women share equally, praise the Lord, in the blessing of salvation, there are some governing and teaching roles that are different within the church. And that's what it means to be complementarian. That is the foundation of what I'm going to take us through here in just a few minutes. That is what we believe as Eagles Landing Christian Academy, as a ministry of Eagles Landing First Baptist Church, based on you know, what we see in God's Word. And I think it's important to understand that because really when you think about it, that is a beautiful thing. When that is done in a biblical way, when a marriage is, is, takes place in a... In a, in a a biblical way, and nine times out of ten, it's the man who's at fault for not making that work the way it's supposed to because he's not lovingly leading his wife in a way that honors Christ, then everything begins to break down. There's disharmony. There's these fractures that take place, and we see it. We see it across our school. Uh, we've seen it in our own families to a certain extent at different times. But when it is done the way God has intended it, we definitely see the harmony, the complementing that takes place between the two. Well, there's no better place to go when we look at this idea of future women than in the, um, the book of Proverbs. And I'm going to look at that here in just a second, but what we're going to spend some time today doing is answering these two questions. What is a woman or a young lady for us in our school context or in our homes, what does a young lady of excellence look like? So what's the finished product going to look like? We're going to see in Proverbs 31. But then also, we're going to try to break apart some of what is the culture telling our girls they should look like. You know, we, Halloween is a, a, an opportunity to see what the culture tells our young ladies what they should look like. And it's uh, sexualized to, you know, the furthest degree. And, and everything that, I'm not talking about every part of it, but a ton of it is increasingly, increasingly sexualized. And also, I mean, I can't tell you how many times, and I just heard it again today, a parent who will come and say, I, I just can't find anything anymore for my daughter to wear when I go out and go shopping or anything that's any way modest for them to be able to wear. Because our whole culture is speaking to their hearts and minds to say, basically put yourself out there. This is how you should act. This is what you do to get attention towards yourself. 
It's not the type of attention they, they should want or need, but it is the attention that they get. So what is our culture telling our girls? So four or five characteristics as we go through these, and I'll try to make them as interesting as possible because y'all seem more tired today. Do we need to stand up and, Ms. Fairley, and exercise? No. You won't hurt my feelings if you fall asleep. All right. The book of Proverbs is full of descriptions of what women should not look like and what men should not look like. If you go through the book of Proverbs, you have all these fool descriptions. Foolish boy, foolish man, don't be foolish, don't be foolish, don't do this, don't do this. But you also see the antithesis to Proverbs 31 throughout the book of Proverbs where you see all these descriptions of what a foolish woman looks like. She's described in a lot of different ways. And in, and in, tr in keeping with true origins fashion, I'm not going to spend time talking about the opposite of what she should look like. We're just going to talk about what she should look like. And things like you see in there, the adulterous woman is talked about in the book of Proverbs. The woman who flatters with her lips is talked about there. The woman, again, adulterous who forsakes the covenant with her husband. The loud, boisterous woman. That's one of the things we really uh, struggle with with our young ladies today. Loud, boisterous, look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me. And the way they do it is through a clamoring spirit. And we have to speak to that, right? It's, you shouldn't draw attention to yourself, if, even if you're a boy or a girl. It doesn't matter by being loud and boisterous and clamorous and foolish to gain that attention. It's not the type of attention you want. The rebellious woman. Is, is talked about in Scripture, and then the quarrel, quarrelsome woman, the corner of the rooftop type thinking. That is talked about in the book of Proverbs. But what we want to look at are these characteristics of what does um, this Proverbs 31 excellent woman look like. And here's the first one. The first thing that we see in here is her character. Now, this is kind of a compilation of several things, and I'll give these to you at some point, but some things that I've seen on places like Desiring God and uh, grace to you with John MacArthur, some things that I've put together through that, a lot of John MacArthur stuff, but these characteristics that we see, that we want to see in our young ladies. If you will, if you, if you have your Bibles, let's open up to Proverbs 31, and we'll start with verse number 10. Should be, I know, a very familiar passage to you, but we'll just break it down a little bit together. It says in verse 10, An excellent wife, who can find? She is far more precious than jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her. And he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. So the first characteristic that we see in an excellent wife, which should be true or becoming true in our young ladies, and we're speaking to this and challenging them to be this, is that she has incredible character. And he says here in this, and this is, we sort of see the thrust of this in chapter 31, verse 11, where it says, the heart of her husband trusts in her. He has, another way of putting it, he has full confidence in her. He can leave, and we'll see this, he, he can leave and go and do whatever he's being called to do, whether it be in his job or wherever he's going, but his heart has full confidence in her and trust in her that he can believe that what she is telling him is true. And that's one of the things that speaks immediately to the character of the woman, this excellent wife. In fact, as you break that down, that second thing, there is an intimate relationship that it's based on complete trust. That's what happens within that home. That, that's, that's what happens in marriage, hopefully. It's happening in yours and in mine and, and in godly marriages if, if, if you are married. But you have that complete trust that's based on an intimate relationship. I put down for you there some of the stuff from our Kingdom Parenting course because it's a, it's a pathway to divorce. Every marriage involves intimacy, and intimacy is always disrupted through conflict. We all have conflict. If you, if you don't have conflict in your marriage, then you have a very boring marriage. And that's fine, too. Boring's good. Everybody, though, at some point is going to have a little conflict every now and then. So when we have conflict, I always have to be husband, taking the lead, lovingly leading spiritually. We're always driving back to what? Intimacy, right? That's what we're supposed to be doing. We're always, the car's heading back to intimacy. It has nothing whatsoever to do with sexual intimacy, and we understand that. It's much, 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 much deeper than that. And so when there's conflict, and Julie and I have conflict all the time, my job and her job is to work back towards intimacy. But what normally happens in the sinful heart of man and woman, because we think we're right, 
and we think they're wrong and they need to make it right, we take the next step as we withdraw. That's the next step. We're going to take a step away. Now we're, we're, pa- we're like those two ships, right, passing in the night. We're withdrawing from one another. We're just not going to deal with it. We're speaking, you know, but there's, we're not fighting back to, to intimacy. But then the next step, right before divorce, is now we have isolation. We're completely isolated from one another. Now kids start asking questions like, well, why, y'all, why aren't we eating together? Why, what is it, why is it that y'all aren't talking? What's going on in the house? Why is it that dad is here, you're here? What's going on? And, and that's starting to happen within the home. And then the next logical step, of course, is we've got to separate and divorce. And so as Christians, our job is to always be pushing back to intimacy. Man, as soon as we get in that conflict stage, all right, I know I'm going to have to give on this. I'm going to have to swallow my pride. I'm going to have to shut my mouth. I'm going to have to see where I'm wrong in this. I'm going to have to forgive. I'm going to have to ask for forgiveness and drive him back to intimacy. Resolve the conflict right now. Don't let it get to withdrawal. Don't definitely let it get to isolation. And if we do get there, or if we're counseling people who are there, if we're speaking to our young women, our young ladies in the school who may be experiencing or seeing these types of things, push it back. And, and, and by, by the way, I, I know I'd, I'd probably need to preface all of this, but sometimes there are reasons for withdrawal. I know there are abusive relationships and things like that, and I'm not speaking to that. I'm speaking in general terms of average type things that people deal with in their marriages that they don't resolve, which they should resolve. So then what happens? That next thing, just speaking to her character, her heart, or his heart, excuse me, is completely at ease, speaking about the husband, and hers is as well. He can leave for whatever reason. He knows that she can completely be trusted. Because, and this is this mutual relationship that takes place between the two. His good is her greatest desire. She wants his good. And he wants her good. And so he's going to protect the house. Nothing's coming in here. Nothing's going to... I'm not going to expose my wife to anything or I'm not going to expose my daughters to anything. I, that's my job, right, as a husband. That's your job if you are a husband and a father to protect the house because all we want is their good. Where it breaks down is when we start wanting just our good and then we come into conflict. But also because her good is his greatest desire, and this is the hard part for men, right? She's willing to step up and say, hmm, you're heading in the wrong direction. I'm going to confront sin or weakness. The the wife is willing to do that because she loves him so much that she's willing to step in and say that, whatever it is that needs to be said. What I like about this passage, and actually my wife was the first one who ever shared this with me. I had never seen it before, but if you look at verse number 12, and I think this is where we need to speak to our young ladies, it actually says that she does him good and not harm all the days of her life. Not all the days of their marriage. So as a teenage girl, not being married, but looking towards the day of being married, she should be doing him good, meaning she's keeping herself pure and unspotted from the world. That's how she does him good all the days of her life. And that's where we need to kind of step in and say to our young ladies, are you doing him good? Whoever he is one day, well, whoever he will be, all the days of your life, what are you exposing your mind to? What are you exposing your heart to? What are you exposing your body to? All of those things, you're doing him good all the days of your life. And then when you're with him, you can say that, for all the days of my life, I've done you good. So to end that, you know, verse 23, you get, you get the result of this. If you look down in chapter 31, verse 23, it says, that as, as a result of that, her husband, you know, he's able to go out and cause things to flourish and focus on the, the providing aspect of what God's called him to do that we looked at last time with, um, with our future men. And as a result of that, her and the way that she acts and the way that she conducts herself, her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. She is the catalyst for that. It's not him. I mean, God's blessing him too, but she's the catalyst for that because he's able to focus on those things knowing, knowing that he can trust her, that, that she has his good, that she's seeking his best. 
And I think, you know, that it's just a, a great description there of the character of a woman. It's what we ought to see in our young ladies. We should be speaking to that in them right now. Second thing, we see in here her devotion to her home. If you look at this, you see a transition here in verse number 13. It goes from, she does him good, not harm, all the days of her life. Um, and I thought this was good and, and in this paragraph, and I'll look at it here in just a second on the second page. She says, even the annoying Proverbs 31 wife. This, this lady is annoying, isn't she? She's... Okay, that fell flat. Maybe she's not to you. <laughs> she seems too good to be true, but, um, but look what she does. Verse 13, she seeks wool and flax. She works with willing hands. She's like the ships of the merchant. She brings her food from afar. She rises wild as yet night, provides food for her household, portions for her maidens. She considers a field and buys it with the fruit of her hands. She plants a vineyard. She dresses herself with strength and makes her arms strong. She perceives that her merchandise is profitable. Her lamp does not go out at night. She puts her hand to the distaff and puts her hands also, or her hands hold the spindle. She opens her hand to the poor and reaches out her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of snow for her household, for all her household are clothed in scarlet. Now, what this means and what this is saying and what we need to speak to our young ladies is that her first priority, her heart, is towards her home. That's the natural bent of a, of a, of a young lady and, and of a woman. It's a very natural thing. And, and I think this is a point where it's good to explain what I think Proverbs 31 is saying, so I'm not miscommunicating this. This does not mean that she only works in the home. In fact, what you see here is that she's very industrious in a lot of different things, but her focus is always back towards her children and her husband. She's doing what she does for their good, for their benefit, for their sake. And in the same respect, Culturally speaking, we can't look on the, the flip side of that and say that someone who stays in the home is in some way an illegitimate profession. And we do see that some within the culture, where people will look at that and say, man, that person's just kind of wasting their life because they decided to do that. that that's not true either. And we, we ought to celebrate that, and we ought to celebrate the other side where they're... And I see, I see this every morning when I'm walking across the, the plaza to come over here into this area from my office, and I see you guys pulling all these kids and you're bringing them all in and you're making a ton of sacrifices with time and energy and effort because you really believe in Christian education for your children. And you're, you're doing all these different things that I see here kind of embodied in Proverbs 31 because you see it as important. You see that, I'm not questioning the reason why you went into education. I know a lot of you just love to teach, but a lot of you are part of this because you want your kids to have the exposure to Christian education. I think that's an awesome thing, and I think God will bless that. And so you see in this that she's doing all of these different things. She's working. She's toiling. She's always thinking about the first priority is to her home. There's nothing more beautiful, and there's no greater heart for children than what comes from their mothers. It's just built inside of them. They love those babies. Their heart is connected to them, much more so than, than the men. Their heart is to go out and do this and cause, you know, all these different things. Their heart is to that child, and they love that child, and they want the best for that child. And, of course, so does the father. And you see that here as you go through Proverbs 30, 31 and all the things that she does. Her first priority is to the home. She's devoted manager and ruler of her home. We ought to encourage our young ladies. Have children. Enjoy that, love them, sacrifice, pour into their lives. It's a beautiful thing, and it's um, something that is a blessing from the Lord, as His Word says. The next thing that we see about her in chapter 31, verse 20, is that her generosity is evident. It says, she opens her hand to the poor, and she reaches out her hands to the needy. It's unfortunate, and I see it in my house too, is the things that, were such a great pleasure to us growing up are an expectation to my children. And as a result of that, they don't always have a heart for the things maybe they should have a heart for. And I'm talking about simple things like going to McDonald's, which was just like a celebratory, 
this is a life-changing event. I can remember Dairy Queen on the way home from our church growing up in downtown Athens. And we'd ride past Dairy Queen, and every night, Wednesday night of church, we, we would have the same chant. Turn, Daddy, turn. <laughs> and he's in that big white station wagon. He's just like heading straight past it. But sometimes he would turn, right? And then we would just be like, oh. And even then, I can remember... My dad would, like, make us split cheeseburgers and stuff like that, you know. <laughs> Crazy stuff. And then our kids today, it's like, it's an expectation. Where are we going to eat tonight? You know, it's that totally different concept than what we experienced. And I'm not, you know, I'm not downing all that. There's, there's good and bad to, to both sides. But I think as a result of that, Sometimes we have maybe more of a heart for those who are in need. We've been there. We've experienced that. And sometimes it's harder now for our kids because they haven't experienced need or want. And so we have to give them opportunities. Praise the Lord yesterday for World Impact Day, getting ready for World Impact Week. It's to give them a heart for those things that they should have a heart for. And we ought to pray for that in our young ladies and in our young men. Not only that, but just a couple more and we'll be done. She has an influence as a teacher Look at chapter 31, verse 25. This is her platform. This is where she can teach from. It says that strength and dignity are her clothing. And we got to speak that to our young ladies, that they would have strength and dignity. Everything about the culture wants to destroy their dignity. And the young men want to destroy their dignity. And oftentimes the young women want their dignity to be destroyed. They have no dignity. But strength and dignity should be her clothing. And as a result of that, she laughs at the time to come. What is dignity? I like this definition, and I like this MacArthur quote. She is elevated above common things or trivial things. She is not about what does not matter. That's a great description. We need more of our girls. We need to preach to them a little bit more about don't be about what doesn't matter. Don't chase after trivial, useless things. You know, I, my example is my wife, so I'm sure you all have your own examples, but my wife hates trivial things, and I appreciate that about her. There's two things that she hates. She hates video games, and she hates reality television. And I do everything I can to get her to be involved in both. <laughs> Just as kind of a game, like we got a Wii, I'm like, come on, come play this. And I think she would really want to. She just sees it as trivial and a waste of time. And she, I think it would just be a convicting, egregious thing to her spirit. I'm not knocking you if you're like a video game fanatic in here, okay? Or if every night you have to watch Survivor reruns. But to her, that is, when you may have your different stuff. To her, she sees those things to be about things that do not matter. Useless. So anytime that I, I may say, well, hey, let's watch Honey Boo Boo for a few minutes. <laughs> I'm kidding about that. If you don't know what that is, that is good. Because our president, our president even knows what that is. So if she sees me watching reality television, I think she kind of, I go down. Like, she looks at me as being almost worthless. Like... <laughs> Like, I need to go shower or something. <laughs> and I think it's in her mind. It's just the way she's wired, and I'm not always wired that way. And, and you're all wired that way as well to a certain extent. There are things that you would say, and I think this is where we need to talk to our young ladies. Why did you watch that? That's beneath the dignity of you as a, a, as a young lady. That's beneath. And I'm not talking about Honey Boo Boo. I'm talking about whatever. <laughs> the movies they talk about, the garbage they talk about, we need to speak to them not as oh, I can't believe you're going to hell. We need to be talking about, really? That just lowered your dignity. That just brought you down. The Bible says you're supposed to be clothed in dignity. You're clothed in such a way that you're not about what doesn't matter. All those peripheral gossipy things that go on with girls, don't be about that. It doesn't matter. It's a non-issue. Be about Christ. Be about honoring Christ in the way that you live your life. Clothe yourself in dignity. Don't get involved in the garbage. Don't lower yourself into that. MacArthur says she has the power of true character, and it's expressed in the fact that she smiles at the future. Oh, that's good, right? She just smiles at it. She toils, 
She clothes herself in dignity, which is actually what it means there is Christian character. She bathes herself in God's word. And she's just, it's just an aroma. It comes out of her. And then she just smiles at the future. God's in control. I'm not worried about it. And then her, what's happening? All the little children around her are looking at their largest influencer and their largest teacher, and they're not speaking this truth. They're living this truth, and so they're, they're catching it all the time. My mother never was like that. My mother never was anxious. My mother, my mother never was this or that because they see those, that Christian character just flowing from her. That's what we need to teach our young ladies. That's what we teach them by our own lives in the classroom. That, that teacher just smiled at the future. She knew God was in control or he knew God was in control. So what happens? What's the result? Verse 26 says, As a result of that, she opens her mouth and what comes out? <coughs> Wisdom and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. As a result of the dignity, the Christian character she's just clothed herself with, when she opens her mouth, it just pours out. And I think this is where this is a good well, this is a good time to share the key to this. I think this is the key for future men and future women. Too often we pursue the characteristics of those things instead of pursuing Christ. And as a result, we get neither. And so you really need to make it a point in your life, and I'm speaking to me, pursue Christ and these characteristics flow from that pursuit. Because when I read Future Men, I'm like, okay, I got to go and roughhouse with my boys today after school. Or I got to go throw the football with Charlie so he's, you know, gets manly or whatever. <laughs> and not that Charlie's not manly, but more manly, you know, and... But unfortunately, we get it all messed up because we think that we got to pursue the characteristics instead of pursuing Christ. And the pursuit of Christ, obviously, out of that comes these things. She's just clothing herself in dignity all the time. She's pursuing Christian character. She's loving Christ. And these things just naturally flow out of that. And we should praise the Lord for that. And the result there, as I said, she guides her family with wisdom. It just pours out of her mouth. She opens her mouth. Wisdom comes out. The teaching of kindness is always on her tongue. She's a big, big, big influence to anyone she comes in contact with. She has excellence that is a saint. As we kind of wrap this up, look at verse 28. This is what we're looking for, right? Her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her. Remember, the blessed thing, rising and calling blessed, that's a future reward. If your children think you're the coolest thing in the world right now when they're young, you might be sowing the wind and reaping the whirlwind. They probably should think right now that you're not always the coolest person in the world. You know what I mean? They should know that there's a line, that you're the adult, that you love them, and that there's going to be discipline and there's a strong relationship there. But it's, this is a future thing where maybe 30 or 40 or 50 years they arise and say, like I was talking to Archie Baker the other day, his mother, I think they have like 16 kids in their family. And he was, arise, he was calling her blessed. I don't know what, at what points in his life he did that, but he was saying it then. She, just, she has just passed away and he was arising and calling her blessed because of the life that she lived, the way that she you know, ministered to their family. But not only that, in verse 29, it says, Many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceitful. Beauty is vain. I really thought about just spending the whole time today talking about just that one verse. That, that's the heart of what we're dealing with with young ladies today. Until we get past that, until we really speak to their heart and say, help them to understand that charming, being charming will not get you where you want to go. And beauty is not the answer to all of your issues. Once we get them past that superficial type thinking, that's where they really begin to grow in Christ. Charm is deceitful. Beauty is fading. So our challenge to our young men and our women, young women, is to always look past those superficial things. We were just talking today with um, SLI. And I was reminding them of last year when we talked about dating. And what we told them... This is what we ought to speak to them, I think, is, and this is not new to me. I stole this, but it's helpful, is that before they ever even consider a dating relationship, if they ever consider it in high school, which I don't think they should, 
their whole focus should be in running to Christ, running to Christ, running to Christ. And then they should look to their right and to their left, and whoever's running with them, that's who they ought to marry. And that's what we need to keep preaching to them, because so often they're, they might be running to Christ, and they're marrying some dude that's like way back there somewhere. And they're trying to pull him up or pull her up or whatever the case may be, and it just doesn't work well like that. And so when they're running and they're, who's with me? This is who I ought to commit my life in marriage to. That's when charm and beauty and all those things begin to fade away. Because you don't see that in Proverbs 31 anywhere. Now, I envision Proverbs 31 as a beautiful woman. But it's not a superficial beauty, right? There's something beautiful about that woman because of the characteristics that flow from her. And then, just to end things up, I want to refer you to this Confessions of a Conflicted Complementarian, and then we'll be done. Here's, here's what I was talking about earlier, where she says, my head lifts. <clears throat> I just want to read it to you. She says, in Christ, instead of feeling condemned by the law standard, this is... You, it's easy for you to walk out of this. I walked out of my future men thing last time. I'm like, oh, I got so much to do because I, mi- I miss it all the time. I read books like that and I miss it. I'm like, I got to go do that list of things to get those things in my children. Instead of feeling condemned by the law standards, we just looked at the law. I can lift my head. I can look at Scripture's words to women, even the annoying Proverbs 31 wife, not with condemnation but with hope and inspiration Her children rise up and call her blessed. Yes, that is the great ideal. No, I can't make it happen myself. Just got to underline that like 20 times. Instead of hiding from God in condemnation or despising her as an unattainable standard, I turn to God in my need and find grace and mercy. In Christ, I can boldly access my Father in heaven and avail myself of His resources. My friends at other stages of life and those experiencing painful circumstances different from mine give testimony of the same hope in the gospel. So, where is the only place you find comfort to do this is by pursuing Christ, period. If you leave here today with a certain checklist or a certain feeling of condemnation or a certain feeling of worthlessness or whatever the case may be, you need to confess that. That's pride. We confess that pride, ask the Lord to forgive us of that, and then we pursue Christ. Maybe it starts this evening diving into His Word. Uh, I know I'm preaching to people who spend a lot of time in His Word. But we we pursue Christ, we pursue Christ, and then out of the natural flow of that, that begins to affect those people who are around us, our students, our children, our spouses, whatever your situation may be. And in that, I know that God will be most glorified in our school. Let's pray. Lord, thank You for Your Word. Thank You for um, Proverbs 31. Lord, we know that it is... uh...